Welcome back for our second session in our study of the blessed life. I'm Ryan Alcott, and in the last session, we looked at the first choice that we have to make on the road to freedom. We call it the reality choice, where I choose to admit that I have hurts and habits and hangups and that I'm powerless to fix them on my own. God is God, and I'm not. In this session, we're going to look at the second step, what we call the hope choice, where I choose to believe that God exists, that I matter to him, and that he has the power to help me recover. Now, there are three parts to making this second healing choice on the road to freedom. First, I have to acknowledge God's existence. You know, the Bible says that anybody that comes to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Many of you probably have no problem with believing in God's existence. So the question for most people is not, is there a God? But the real question is, what kind of God is he? What is he really like? And sadly, many of us have some pretty strange ideas about what God is like. You know, some people think that God is like their earthly father. And that can be tragic because if your father was abusive or uncaring or distant or even absent, then you're going to tend to see God that way too. Some people think they're just going to make up an idea of God and they'll say, well, you know, my idea of God is. Or they'll say, I've always thought of God as. or I like to think of God as, you know, whenever I hear that, I always want to say, well, you know what? Who made you the authority? Just because you have a certain idea about God doesn't mean that that idea is true. Doesn't mean that it's accurate. It doesn't mean that it's right just because you made it up. No, it really doesn't matter what I'd like to think God is like. What matters is what he is really like. I mean, they're just making it up. And so they go along with their opinion and Sometimes their opinion changes with circumstances. What I want to know is, what is God really like? So not only do I need to acknowledge God's existence, but I also need to understand his character. And that's part of this step in the road to freedom and recovery and growth. You see, until I know what God is really like, I can't trust him. I'm not going to trust somebody or something that I know nothing about. But fortunately, God wants us to know what he's really like. So he came to earth over 2,000 years ago in the form of a human being. It split history into AD and BC. Everything else we evaluate on our calendar is judged by when God came to earth as Jesus Christ. Why did he do that? So we can really know what God is really like. See, without Jesus coming to earth, you wouldn't know a lot about God. Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. Do you want to know what God's really like? Just take a look at Jesus, because he is the visible expression of the invisible God. He is God in human form. See, I can't relate to some, you know, force or or spirit in the sky. I need something with flesh on him so I can say, oh, that's what God's like. Now, if you're reading about Jesus and, and you're studying his life and you learn a whole lot about God, let me tell you three things that you're going to learn about God that, that I've learned from Jesus about God that have helped me to get over my hurts and habits and hang-ups. First, if you start studying about Jesus and about God, you're going to figure out pretty soon that God knows all about my situation. God knows everything that's ever happened in your life. He knows the good and the bad, the ups and the downs, every experience you've ever had. Some of you have had a tough week. You may have had a tough month. Maybe you've had a tough life. But you know what the Bible says? It says this in Psalm 31, you have seen the crisis in my soul. God sees the crisis in your soul right now. Did you know that? The Bible also says in Psalm 56, you know how troubled I am. You have kept a record of my tears. Isn't that incredible? The Bible says that God knows you up close and personal. In fact, he's kept a record of every tear you've cried. You know, you may be thinking, nobody knows the pain I'm going through right now in this marriage or in this situation. You know what? You're wrong. God does. God knows exactly what you're struggling with. He knows about the habits you're struggling to break, but can't get out of your mind. He knows. You say, nobody knows the depression or the fear that I'm going through right now. Well, God does. And he's kept a record of your tears. And he knows everything about you. And he still loves you. Nothing escapes God's notice. 
Psalm 69, 5 says, Oh God, you know how foolish I am. Sometimes I think we want to forget that part. We don't want God to know all the dumb stuff we've done, but the fact is, there's nothing off the record with God. He knows the good days, the bad days, the dumb stunts, the foolish decisions, and amazingly, he still loves me and he still loves you. The fact is, God is not shocked by your sin. He doesn't go, whoa, I did not see that one coming. In fact, God knows you are going to do it even before you did, and he even knows what motivated you, and he also even knows what you don't know about your own motivation. God is not shocked. He's never surprised, and he knows you completely. Here's the second thing about Jesus that it, he tells us about God. He not only knows everything about your situation, but he cares about it. God cares about my situation. Psalm 103 says, he's like a father, a father to us, tender and sympathetic. He knows what we're made of, and he remembers that we are dust. In other words, God knows how frail we are. He knows you better than you know yourself, really. He wants to be the father many of you have never even had, a father who's tender and sympathetic. God says, I have loved you with a love that lasts forever, and I have kept on loving you with faithful love. Are you getting this? God's love never fails. He loves you on your good days, and he loves you on your bad days. He loves you when you serve him and when you don't. When you feel it, when you don't feel it, when you're right, when you're wrong, God even loves you when you're angry or selfish or out of control. Do you know that? He loves you when you're breaking his heart. How does he keep on loving you? Well, because God's love is unconditional. It's not based on your performance. It's based on God's character. It's not based on what you do. It's based on who he is. God is love. That's what the Bible says. And God says, I have loved you with a love that lasts forever. No man or woman will ever love you the way that God does. God not only knows about your situation, he cares about it, and he cares so much that he sent his son, Jesus, to come to earth to show you that he cared for you and to die for you, even before you knew you needed somebody to die for you, even before you cleaned up your act. Scripture says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, while I was still thumbing my nose to God and ignoring God, God was taking the initiative. You know, anybody who's ever been on a recovery program like a 12-step program knows that the second step of the healing choices is the higher power choice. Well, I'd like to introduce you today to your higher power. He's got a name. He's not just a power. He's a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. Jesus is that higher power that you can plug into because he knows all about your situation. He cares all about your situation, and the best news of all is he can change a situation. He's got the power to change it. He is that higher power. He's not some fake, some phony, immaterial spirit. The Bible tells us that this is the third thing Jesus teaches us about God, that God can change me and God can change my situation. Here's what the Bible says. This means that anybody who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old is gone. A new life has begun. Friend, I can't tell you how much good news that is. Notice it's not a, a new leaf turning over a new leaf. It's you get a new life. Now, God can change you and God can change your situation. Sometimes he changes you. Sometimes he changes situations. Sometimes he changes both. But he's waiting on you to take this next step in the healing choice. And that's this step. Accept God's offer to help you. You see, friends, God has the power that you need to find freedom from those hurts and those habits and those hangups that continually mess up your life and your relationships. And God offers you the power to change. You see, it's not just enough to believe in God. So what? The devil believes in God. The Bible says that Satan knows he exists. Most people believe in God, and that hasn't wiped away the hurt. You've got to plug into the power, and that takes more than just believing he exists. Here's what God has to offer. First, the Bible says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That's out of the book of Philippians, the, the desire and the power. You see, God says willpower on your own is not enough. Good intentions are not enough. New Year's resolutions are not enough. What you need is my will and my power to help you change, God says. And I will give you that power. But the only way you're going to get it is if you surrender to me and, and let me fill your life with my love and my spirit and my power. Now, the Bible says this, 
The spirit that God has given us fills us with power and love and self-control. Did you get that? Look at that verse. God gives us power and love and self-control. Oh man, how much do I need those things in my life? First, I need power in my life. I want the power to break the bad habits that I cannot break on my own. And I want power to do the things that I know I can't do, but need to do, that are right to do, but I can't seem to get them built into my life. And I want the power to break free from the past, break free from those memories that haunt my mind and hurt me, and where I let other people continue to hurt me from the past. I need that kind of freedom. I need God's power, but then I need more than power. I need love, and that's the second thing God offers. I need real love, not lust, not attachment. I need love. And I want to be able to love people and have them love me in return. I want to be able to offer it and I want to be able to accept it in a healthy way. I want to have genuine intimacy without the walls, without the phoniness, without the masks, without faking it, without the fear of being found out. That's the kind of power and that's the kind of love that, if we're honest, only God can give. You can't get that kind of love from a girlfriend. You can't get that kind of love from a wife or a husband or or anybody else. It's an unconditional kind of love. And I'm, I'm sorry, but none of us are capable of constantly giving unconditional love. Now, God also says this. He says, number three, I will give you self control. That's what happens when I put my spirit into your life. You see, you're not really in control until Christ is in control and the master of the circumstances of your life. As he controls my life, he gives me the strength to control the things that are out of control. Only then are you going to be able to get it all together for the very first time in your life, because you are not trying to pull it all together on your own anymore, pulling you up by your own bootstraps or or psych yourself up or go, you know, I hope, I wish, I want, I might. No, now you've got real power, real love, real self-control. You know what I'm talking about, friends? It's not just some theory. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of other people who've walked through these steps and principles and these choices that God calls us to make. You know, I've learned that that things work best when they're plugged in, you know, like toasters, blenders, TVs, phone chargers. Things generally work better when they're plugged in. God never meant for you to go through life being disconnected from him, being unplugged. That's why we talk here at Northfield about getting connected to God. And why recovery can be an important part of that connection. We want to be plugged into God. We want to be reconnected when we've been disconnected for so long. How do I do that? How do I reconnect to God's power? How do I plug into God's power? You know, we'll talk more in depth next week about the commitment choice, but it starts with hope. It starts with an acknowledgement that you are not God, but that God loves you and offers you the power to change. This is the road to freedom. This is the road to recovery. This is the road to connecting. This is the road to spiritual health. Now, the road is not easy, okay? It means facing up to some of the real problems that you've not wanted to face up to, not wanted to acknowledge. You've wanted to put them under the carpet, put them in the closet, hide them. But freedom comes from taking some risks, and it is the risk of being honest, being authentic, and being trusting of God with who you are. And as you walk through these steps and and these principles and these choices that we're taking you through in this series, you're going to experience freedom from hurts that you've never experienced freedom from before. This is the process of mourning and grieving over your past mistakes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is the beatitude of choice. Blessed are those who mourn. What does that mean? Well, when you make the second healing choice, which we call the hope choice, all of a sudden recovery is no longer simply a matter of your own willpower, because God says, I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to comfort you in your misery. And not only that, I'm going to give you the desire and the power and the self-control to do the right thing for the first time in your life. And the Bible says this, when you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fires of oppression, you will not be burnt up. So let me ask you a very personal question. Where are you hurting? What's the hurt in your life today? Are you going through some deep waters, deep, deep waters? Do you feel like you're going under for the very last time? 
Are you going through the fire right now and, and, and the heat's on in your life and you think, I'm, I'm, I'm toast. I'm going to get burnt up or I'm going to get burnt out. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in a rut and you just can't get the power to break out of that rut, that change. You say, I'm in a relationship I don't know how to get out of and I don't know how to get on with it. I don't know how to get better. Friends, there's a higher power, but he's more than just a power. He's a person. And he wants you to be connected to him on purpose. His name is Jesus. Make the hope choice. Take the things that you've mourned over in your life. Give them to Christ. And he says, you will be comforted. Let's pray. Father, help us to choose hope. Help us to acknowledge you for who you are, not who you wish, who we wish you to be. Help us to seek out your power and your strength and your love and your self-control. Because we know that we are powerless to make the changes that we want to make apart from you. Only you can bring healing and change, lasting change to our lives. Father, we love you and we pray that you would be with us, that your spirit would give us power this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.